Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I want to begin by uh, thanking Michelle uh, for her invitation and the, uh, the Grand Challenges team uh, for the opportunity of speaking to you all uh, this afternoon. Uh, I have many friends uh, in uh, the Minnesota Sociology Department, so it's always really wonderful uh, to be able to visit, and I've, I've had a terrific time and uh, a terrific time. Uh, being able to meet with the graduate students uh, as well. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, so today what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about what has come to be called uh, the problem of mass incarceration uh, and the problem of prisoner re-entry specifically. A lot of this uh, work that I'm going to talk about uh, draws on uh, research in my new book, uh, Homeward, Life in the Year After Prison. But before jumping into research about uh, the, the book, uh, I thought I'd try and provide a little bit of context uh, about how I came to write a book uh, about men and women released from prison in Massachusetts who were returning to neighborhoods around Boston. This, uh, this project was very different from work I'd done uh, in the past. So uh, what I will do is give you, in 30 minutes, uh, no longer, uh, a play in three acts, and Act 1 uh, sets the scene uh, by providing a, a little bit of empirical context that can explain how we got to where we are today. I'm, I suspect that uh, this will be familiar to a lot of you, so this is one place in which I will economise on time. Um, so let's start with Act 1, uh, the story of mass incarceration. Uh, as this room uh, probably knows well, I'm guessing, uh, we measure the incarceration rate in a country, or we measure the scale of a penal system in a country with an incarceration rate, and that is the number of people behind bars on a given day. It's typically measured per 100,000 of the population. If we look at Western Europe, incarceration rates in most of the Western European countries are about 100 per 100,000. So on any given day in Western Europe, about 0.1 of 1% of the uh, entire population uh, is locked up behind bars. Um, of course, in the United States, the rate of incarceration is nearly an order of magnitude higher, 700 uh, per 100,000, 0.7 of 1% uh, of the population uh, are incarcerated. We can also think about how unusual uh, America is today in historical context. We have very good data uh, that go back to the mid-1920s on prison populations. And if we look at the prison incarceration rate from 1925 to the early 1970s, uh, over that period, uh, imprisonment in America was about 100 per 100,000, about where it is uh, in Western Europe today. But in the early 1970s, the system began to grow, grew every year for the next 35 years. And so the current period is really unusual. It's ticked down a little bit uh, over the last decade, but we're still sitting atop of this plateau in which the scale of our prisons and jails is about uh, five times higher than the historic average. Okay, what does this mean in terms of numbers? It means there's about 1.6 million people in state or federal prison. Uh, this isn't the entire incarcerated in pop uh, population because uh, there are people in local jails who were awaiting trial or serving short sentences less than a year. There are about 730,000 people in jail. So 2.2 million, if we add up uh, prison and jail, 2.2 million people are incarcerated in the United States today. That's not the entire correctional population because there's a large group of people who have been to prison and now meeting with parole officers uh, on the outside in the community. So there's about eight, another 850,000 people uh, on parole. That's not the entire community corrections population uh, because there's another 4 million people uh, who are meeting with a probation officer that typically they're uh, serving suspended sentences and uh, uh, they're meeting in a regular way uh, with probation officers in the community. You add it all up, it's about 7 million people are under some kind of correctional supervision in the United States. And this is historically new. These very high rates of correctional supervision have only emerged 
uh, in the last decade or so. Now, the striking as these figures are, this is not what is most important about incarceration in America. The most important thing about incarceration in America is its unequal distribution across the population. So let me try and show you some uh, figures about that very quickly. So everything I've shown you uh, uh, to now has been a snapshot at a point in time. What is uh, the fraction of the population on a given day who are locked up in prison or jail? But we could think about it differently. We could think, what's the likelihood someone is ever going to serve time in prison at some point in their lives? And we might be interested in a statistic like that because we think serving time in prison confers a whole array of disadvantages that continue to affect you even after you've, uh, even after you've left prison. How large is the group of people uh, that is uh, exposed to uh, those adverse life chances? Think of a birth cohort born in the late 1940s, just after World War II. They're reaching their mid-30s around 1979. Okay, so they're growing up before the American prison boom uh, significantly. And think about their lifetime risks of, in, uh, of imprisonment. So now we're talking about the deep end of the system, a felony conviction, 12 months at a minimum in a state or federal uh, facility, 28 months at the median. Some people are serving uh, very significantly longer than that. We're thinking about men specifically, uh, black and white men at different levels of schooling. Very large racial disparity in incarceration. African American men, about six or seven times more likely to be incarcerated uh, than white men. Very steep socioeconomic gradient. If we think of men with low levels of schooling, think of non college men, uh, men who have never had uh, any post secondary education. It's about half of all black men. Uh, in this birth cohort, 45 to uh, 49, about one in eight non-college uh, black men have been to prison, uh, I estimate. This is, uh, comes from work uh, with Becky Pettit, who's a demographer at, uh, at UT Austin. Uh, so Becky and I, we estimated that about 12% uh, of African-American men in this birth cohort uh, have been to prison. If they never finished high school, about 15%. Uh, into prison. Now compare this group to a birth cohort born in the late 1970s, 75 to 79. They're reaching their mid-30s in 2009. They're growing up through the era of mass incarceration. What are their lifetime risks of imprisonment? Non-college African American men, about half of all uh, half of all black men. If they're born in this 1975 to 79 birth cohort. About 36%, we estimate, have been to prison uh, at some point in their lives. Uh, if they never finished high school, about 70% uh, have been to prison. So within a generation, going to prison has become a common life event for black men with very low levels, uh, very low levels of schooling. In this period, for the later cohort, uh, crime is historically low, right? Our, our homicide rates now are at their lowest level uh, since the early 1960s. This change in exposure to the criminal justice system is purely the product of policy change. Uh, crime has gone down, but there was a revolution in uh, criminal justice sentencing policy, uh, and serving time in prison became the uh, presumptive sentence uh, for a felony offence. So, uh, Becky and I were working on this stuff in the early 2000s. And for me, this became very much the social factor uh, upon which a lot of other research I was doing was based. So, what is the effect of this on patterns of racial inequality and, uh, and poverty uh, in America? This very high rate of incarceration uh, among African American men with very low levels of schooling. And I was thinking about labor market outcomes and the effects on families and the effects on children uh, with incarcerated uh, parents. And a lot of other research was growing up around this problem. Uh, it's a big research literature, trying to understand the consequences of incarceration. It's hard to summarize. If I were to summarize all of that work in a single sentence, it would look something like this. Mass incarceration, 
criminalized social problems related to racial inequality and poverty on a historically unprecedented scale. Now, some of these social problems uh, uh, revolved around violence and serious crime, but a lot of these social problems also revolved around things like untreated mental illness, untreated drug addiction, homelessness, uh, and uh, a myriad of adversities that are uh, associated with the very harsh conditions of poverty in America. So mass incarceration criminalized a range of social problems, and because of the negative effects of incarceration on economic opportunities, on health, on the well-being of children, uh, and because these effects were uh, concentrated in a very disadvantaged segment of the population, these effects themselves came to contribute uh, to the reproduction of poverty over the life course from one generation uh, to the next, uh, and patterns of racial inequality. Uh, a lot of this work was summarized in the National Academy of Sciences report. Uh, the headline conclusion of the NAS report uh, on incarceration, this came out in 2014, uh, was, given the small crime prevention effects of long prison sentences, possibly high financial, social, and human costs of incarceration, federal and state policymakers should revise criminal justice policies to significantly reduce the rate of incarceration in the United States. So our headline recommendation was we need to reduce incarceration rates to get back in line with international and historical, uh, historical norms. Now, I was doing a lot of research that was leading to me to uh, a conclusion like this. And I was crunching away at big social science data sets. Um, for the social researchers in the room, I was looking at things like the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth and the, uh, the Fragile Family Study of Child Wellbeing. Um, these data sets weren't particularly designed to study the problem of the effects of uh, incarceration, very high rates of incarceration. And I was sort of, I was frustrated a little bit, I have to say, with the work that I was doing. And I thought that uh, these data sets were not capturing the real lives very well of people who were actually involved in the system. And I was coming to understand uh, the, the lives of people who are incarcerated at least a little bit, because I was beginning to teach in prison at the, uh, at the same time I was uh, doing this research. And I was hearing a, a lot about uh, the lives that people had led that, uh, that led them to prison and, and the challenges that they were anticipating uh, as they uh, came up to release. And the kinds of data I was analysing was kind of thin. Uh, compared to the richness of the lives that people were describing to me. And often, my work was very demographic, right? I was reducing people's lives to four, four variables, um, age, race, uh, sex, and the level of schooling. And yet people were telling me about very much more than that. So I wanted richer data to understand uh, this better. The data I was analyzing uh, you know, these were often panel data sets that interviewed people every year or so. Uh, uh, often, and some uh, some people in national samples would go to prison, and uh, and they would continue to be interviewed after they came out. I didn't have a very granular understanding of this whole social process of leaving this institution where you lived for several years, and then tr having to try and find a place in the community again. Uh, after, uh, after you've been incarcerated. And I wanted to understand that in a more granular way, understand what this social process looked like. And the data I was analysing was not very good at telling me about that, I think. Finally, I worried a lot about undercoverage. And that means that the kinds of survey methods that we have, particularly based on household samples, are not very good at capturing uh, people who oftentimes uh, uh, are experiencing really serious housing insecurity, who are tenuously uh, attached to household, particularly uh, uh, single men uh, who uh, are not resident where, uh, with their children if they're, uh, if they're parents. I felt we were uh, missing uh, those people uh, with our conventional survey methods and we needed to have them. A different kind of uh, a different kind of analysis 
uh, to make sure uh, that we were observing the life experience of people who were facing the most adversity. Survey methods would, uh, was missing that. So that's the end of Act 1. And, uh, and this brought me to the reentry study. The Boston reentry study uh, was my effort to try and answer my frustrations with the limitations of the research uh, I was doing. Uh, this was a longitudinal interview study uh, conducted in collaboration with Anthony Braga, who's a, a, criminolo a criminologist at Northeastern University, and Rihanna Cole. And Rihanna is, runs the research unit at Department of Correction in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, the idea of the study is that uh, we would pick people up a week before prison release. And uh, there was really only one criteria for eligibility to participate in our research. And that is you had to be returning to a neighborhood in the Boston area. And, and this meant we interviewed men and women. We're in pre-release centers and we're in maximum security. Uh, we talk to people who were uh, in disciplinary segregation and solitary confinement uh, a week before they were released to the street. Uh, we talk to people behind plexiglass in non-contact units. We're in the state psychiatric hospital, which in Massachusetts uh, is run by the Department of Correction. We got incredible access uh, from the DOC. Uh, and we're in uh, altogether 16 of the 18 facilities uh, in that system. Uh, and I was bringing the, my perspective to it really as a poverty researcher. I want to understand people's economic opportunities, their housing, their health, their family relationships, uh, uh, and also their uh, criminal involvement and criminal justice contact. The data are very rich, and there's a lot I could say about it, but I want to emphasize just three things uh, for today. One is, as we got to know people, uh, we were starting to hear a lot about the violence that they had experienced in their lives. And certainly it was the case that a lot of the people we were talking to had perpetrated serious violence uh, against others, and this was part of the reason that they were incarcerated. Uh, but people had also experienced very serious victimisation, and this often uh, started very early in childhood. People had seen a lot of violence. Uh, in their lives, both in the neighbourhoods they were growing up in and um, uh, in their family homes. And so by the time we got to our exit interview, our 12-month interview, we significantly redesigned our survey, actually. Uh, we felt, you know, we had to ask people about their exposure to trauma uh, in childhood. We developed a new module uh, to try and tap into that. So people were exposed to a lot of violence. Second thing... Uh, Men and women coming out of prison are in poor health, uh, on average. Uh, high rates of uh, chronic disease, infectious disease, uh, a lot of chronic pain, uh, uh, a lot of mood disorders, depression, uh, anxiety, PTSD. Uh, and for about 15 or 20 percent of our sample, uh, uh, we saw serious mental illness, uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, uh, and so on. Uh, last thing, very serious material hardship uh, after incarceration. Median income from a year after prison in the Boston sample uh, was $6,000. And that's about half the income, uh, the, that's about half the total poverty line uh, for an individual living alone. So at the median, in the year after prison, uh, people are living at a level of what poverty researchers call deep poverty. Um, a lot of housing insecurity, people uh, are basically, uh, there's uh, no independent housing that we observe uh, in our sample in the year after prison. People are either doubled up with family, uh, or they're in transitional housing programs, uh, or they're in uh, the shelter system, or they're street homes. Let me show you very quickly some empirical markers, both of exposure to trauma in childhood and uh, health problems in adulthood. Uh, so very high rates uh, of drug use in the uh, family, the childhood families of uh, the respondents, uh, uh, a lot of evidence of family violence in uh, the homes of the respondents that uh, we were talk, uh, talking to. 40% of our sample had witnessed a violent death. 
uh, while they were kids. The parents have lost custody of them 40% uh, of the time. In many cases, this was uh, because of juvenile detention. Uh, family members had been uh, victimized uh, by serious crime, depression, suicidality, uh, and about 20% of the sample reported to us they were sexually abused as kids. Poor health, what does that look like? 60% uh, of this, 60% uh, of the sample reported to us that they had a history of drug or alcohol problems. Uh, about half had reported uh, diagnoses of depression, chronic pain, chronic disease. Um, about 30% uh, uh, had reported opioid use, uh, lots of anxiety. And about 15% uh, reported serious mental illness, uh, psychotic conditions. The interesting thing is, if you count up both um, the markers of trauma in childhood uh, and poor health, which we called uh, human frailty in the study, these markers of uh, poor physical and mental health. Uh, if you uh, just add up these different markers of childhood trauma and uh, human frailty in adulthood, the two things are related. So the people who are exposed uh, to the most trauma in childhood were in the poorest health uh, in adulthood. Uh, if people were abused as kids, uh, then their health was even poorer than we would expect, uh, given the level uh, of trauma that they'd been exposed to uh, in childhood. Final part of this story, those in the poorest health experienced the greatest material hardship after release. We can divide the sample roughly in half according to the scale of human frailty. We could talk about the frail, those who uh, experienced the greatest uh, mental and physical health problems and the not frail. Uh, among the frail, which is indicated by the yellow line here, uh, they were most likely to be using opioids in the year after prison release. So here we're looking at people uh, one week after prison release, two months, six months and 12 months, which was the uh, schedule for our interviews uh, over the year after uh, incarceration. So the people with the most health problems were the most likely to be using uh, opioids. Uh, the people with the most health problems were the most likely to have the most unstable housing, most likely to be in shelters and uh, uh, transitional housing programs or to be street homeless. Uh, employment improved uh, over the year uh, for everyone. Uh, and so uh, by 12 months out, about uh, half of the sample were working, but the employment opportunities were worse for people uh, in the poorest health, and often they had work-limiting disabilities. I'm going to skip through that, and that is the end of Act 2. That is the quantitative evidence around the re-entry study. Now, I think, so a lot of the data I was showing you, right, was looking a lot like the work I was doing earlier, this sort of big demographic work with uh, big data sets. And even though we have much richer data about the process of re-entry, uh, we still don't uh, have a lot of information about the stories. Uh, people's lives, what did they look like? And this is something I try to do uh, in the book, is to capture something of uh, people's life experience and so what I thought I would do is just read you a short passage uh, very quickly to give you a flavor of how I was trying to capture uh, people's lives. So uh, I'm going to tell you about an African-American man. His name is uh, Peter. Uh, Peter was an older black man in his late 40s with salt and pepper hair and an elegant bearing. He arrived early for our interview a week after his release. Waiting on the street, he was hesitant to face the crowd inside the diner at Mattapan. We began the interview by asking Peter, what's the best thing about being out there? This was our icebreaker question at our first follow-up interview. What's the best thing about being out? He said, breathe in fresh air. What's the most challenging thing? Being around a bunch of people, just being in, in public areas. So people were reporting to us a lot of anxiety about crowds and uh, uh, riding mass transit and things like that immediately after incarceration. Although he got anxious in crowds, Peter began his latest release with a flurry of activity. He came home on a Friday, and that morning he bought clothes and got a haircut. He spent time with his sister, 
that first day and stayed over at her house. Uh, Peter uh, worried that he was a burden on what was already a crowded family home. He could have stayed with his father, but his father drank. His brother also stayed there and he was dealing drugs. Uh, being at my father's wasn't a healthy situation. My sister's was the safest place for me, he said. Peter spent his first weekend home with his nine-year-old son. They talked and did some shopping, went to the movies. On his first Monday after getting out, he reported to probation in the morning and then visited his father in the afternoon. On Tuesday, he enrolled in food stamps and then went with his older son later in the day. He went to the welfare office again on Wednesday, uh, then visited his younger son's school to introduce himself to the boys' teachers. Thursday was mental health counselling. By the end of uh, his first week out, Peter had spent time with two of his three children, uh, enrolled in food stamps, obtained a mass transit card, made an appointment for counselling, checked in with several shelters and visited a career centre. The following week, he would begin his job search. So this is, uh, this is what the transition from prison to community looks like uh, on the ground. And in the book, I argue that the overwhelming reality facing people who have been to prison has three main characteristics. Poverty, racial inequality, and violence. And I think this is what we have to come to terms with uh, as a matter of public policy. And I think we're, we're generally not very good uh, in the criminal justice reform conversation about talking about any of these things. Uh, poverty, racial inequality, Violence. And we're certainly not very good at talking about them altogether. I'm going to show you a brief clip of Peter. Um, and he's talking about violence uh, in his life. So that clip uh, suggests to me how violence is sustained uh, over uh, a lifetime. And it shows how the prison itself is a source of violence in people's lives. And it raises the question for me uh, whether incarceration on a massive scale could ever have been a successful anti-violence strategy. Uh, so if not incarceration, what? Perhaps a key lesson of the re-entry study, I think, says something deep uh, about the nature of incarceration. We think about incarceration as a deprivation uh, uh, of liberty, a loss of uh, autonomy. Uh, but I think uh, at a fundamental level, uh, the people that we were talking to in Boston were also disconnected from the intimate bonds of family and friendship and work and community. And the fundamental justice challenge involves strengthening those bonds of family and work and community. And Incarceration offers nothing to that justice challenge, I think. Uh, I want to show you another clip uh, about Peter. Um, and, and, and this is a tough one, I have to say. So uh, Peter's son uh, had a brother. It wasn't Peter's own son but his, uh, his son's brother. Uh, and uh, his son's brother, uh, tragically, was waiting at a bus stop in uh, the neighbourhood of Dorchester in, uh, in Boston. And uh, he was shot and killed. He was 14 years old. He was waiting for, uh, waiting for a bus. And, and Peter is driving uh, his son down to New York uh, to buy a suit uh, for his son uh, for the funeral of his brother. Uh, so, for me, this clip uh, captures you know, the whole paradox of mass incarceration. The, the system uh, demands uh, heroic feats of personal transformation from people. And it's demanding these feats of uh, transformation from people whose agency is often profoundly compromised by uh, lifetimes of trauma and uh, poor health, uh, poor physical health, 
and uh, poor mental health. And I could talk to you a lot more about re-entry policy and what I think we need, but I think at a very human level, what we need is a justice policy uh, that welcomes and secures a place uh, for people who've been drawn into violence, uh, whether it's the violence of street crime or the state violence of mass incarceration. And when I say draw people who are drawn into violence, I mean people who are victims of violence as well as those uh, who have harmed others. Uh, and this is how a community uh, plays its part in this process of transformation. So I want to tell one last story uh, that I hope can fire our imaginations and suggest uh, the opportunities and the possibilities in front of us. I was in Addis Ababa uh, a few years ago uh, for a research project that we had that was studying justice institutions in Ethiopia, and I was at a dinner with two Ethiopian researchers. One of them, Mulaghetto, was telling me about a colleague of his, a German anthropologist who was working at his research institute. And so one day the anthropologist was out in a remote area and he was driving through a small village and, uh, and tragically his car struck a small child and, and, and killed her. Uh, the girl's parents ran outside to see what had happened and the crowd quickly formed around the anthropologist and the parents tended to the child. And the anthropologist asked that the police uh, be called. But he was told that there weren't uh, any police there and the village dealt with uh, things like this by itself. And then the anthropologist was told that he could go, but they were going to send for him in a few days. So he went back to Addis, and a few days later a message came for him that he had to return to the village, and he had to return alone. Uh, so he went to my, my friend Mulligetta and said, what should I do? And Mulligetta said, you've got to go back to the village. Um, so he went back, and when he got there he was escorted to a meeting with the elders of the village. At first, he was told to pay 2,500 bird, that's about $125, to the family uh, of the dead child. And next, he was ordered by the meeting to buy a goat for the family. He purchased the goat, uh, which was uh, immediately slaughtered. And the father of the dead child was then called out to the front of the meeting. And the anthropologist, he was already standing at the front of the room, uh, he was told to hold out his hand. So he held out his hand. And his wrist was bound to the wrist of the child's father with the entrails of the goat. And the village elder then announced that the anthropologist was now a member of the dead girl's family. And that was that. He was free to go. The anthropologist returned to Addis. He was very upset. He felt he hadn't properly compensated the family. He hadn't been punished. Will again said, you've got to understand that for the rest of your life, you're now a part of that man's family. You have all of the obligations of a family member. You have to visit from time to time. If they're going through problems that you might help with, you should help them, just as a member of their own family would. And so Western ideas about punishment and retribution, they're radically absent in this case of customary justice. Like the Ethiopian story, the problem of prisoner re-entry raises the question of when does punishment end? How are debts repaid? These are ethical questions as much as they're empirical questions. And I've tried to maintain this ethical perspective in, in this research. To guide politics or policy, the ethics of punishment has to confront the real stories of people who have been incarcerated. Now, methods are really important to you because they shape what we see and who we hear, what we see and who we hear. Very deeply, very deeply disadvantaged people are often not fully visible to our usual methods of large-scale data collection that, uh, uh, that forms so much of social science. We have to go out into the field and get proximity right, as Brian Stevenson says. This is a question partly about research design, but it's as much a question about uh, our ethical commitments, I think. What do we see and who do we hear? Observing some of our deepest poverty and the suffering that accompanies it uh, yields a very strong test of our values. 
by testing our values against the real conditions of poverty and racial injustice and the violence that surrounds mass incarceration, I hope that we might imagine a better path to justice. So thank you very much. My name is Emily Hunt-Turner, and I am the uh, founder of a local social enterprise, uh, nonprofit social enterprise called All Square. Uh, we are located in South Minneapolis, 41st in Minnehaha, and we have essentially a little brick building, two storefronts. Uh, one is a Kraft Grilled Cheese restaurant, as you guys mentioned, uh, that we have a lot of fun with and would have loved to cater. <laughs> Um, I'm actually kind of glad that we didn't. Um, and the other half is, is our professional institute and what we call um, the Dream Lab. And really our, uh, I mean, thank you so much, Bruce, for queuing up. I think uh, in so many ways, uh, All Square exists to, to try to provide a human response to all that is happening um, in whatever way we're able. And... Our core sort of our core our core goal is to invest in the minds and lives of people who have been through the justice system. So in short, I thought what would be hopefully if it's cool, um, 10 to 15 minutes, right? Brief. Um, talk a little bit about uh, All Square and what we do. Give you guys a little bit of a sense. It's, it's more than grilled cheese for us. And uh, uh, talk just a little bit about myself and my background, given the housing correlation and, and my practice in housing law. And also then talk, most importantly, about some of the reasons that we exist and what we hope to do with All Square as a business and a brand, um, which the two core things tie very beautifully, I think, into um, all that, that Bruce has laid out in his, in his work. So uh, again, our, our goal is to invest in the lives and minds of people who are impacted. And, uh, the way that we do that is uh, we have a cohort, formerly, we call them formerly incarcerated fellows, that travel through a 12-month curriculum. We launched in, we've been, we founded in 2016, but we launched uh, and opened our doors in September of last year. So we're in our first cohort currently. And we have a 12-month curriculum uh, that really is centered on one primary thing. And again, as we sort of build this thing, as we fly it, um, our, our, what we're wanting to do is, is help develop leaders um, in, in our community and cultivate uh, agency, which is, you've noted, is something that is, um, can so often be compromised by the compounding uh, impacts of the carceral system. So the, we have four channels, essentially four ways of approaching this work. Um, through all, the All Square umbrella. One uh, is through workforce development, and that is through the restaurant. Uh, we're really, we think money matters and paychecks matter, um, and currently our fellows are, are making on average between $19 and $22 an hour. The community's been incredible. They tip unbelievably. Um, we pay a living wage, but they make it even sweeter. And, you know, for us, I think, you know, they're on track to make 30000 roughly annually. And that's really important to us. Um, money isn't everything, but it, it sure as hell does matter. And so we, we're excited about that piece. The other, the other three channels that we have in All Square um, really happen through our, our institute. And uh, the first is mental health and restorative services. We have a restorative circle um, led by a gentleman named Jamil Watt every Monday. And between that and um, the therapist that we work with who works one-on-one -on -one with the fellows each week um, on the clock, on our dime, uh, it's been the glue that has held this thing together and I believe will hold it together um, for many years to come. It is could not be understated how important this piece has been for us and it's by far the best investment that we've made. Uh, the other two channels are personal development. In this piece, after with our first cohort, we're learning a lot about what that looks like um, with a really we believe ample paycheck, having the financial tools to um, that I know I'm still working on in my personal life to manage that paycheck and, and invest that money and, and come up with short and long-term plans is super important. Uh, emotional sort of emotional intelligence, self-awareness, again, things things I think we're all working on, uh, having coursework and, and those sorts of things. And then the other piece of it is professional development. That's sort of our fourth channel. And the two, again, all of the activities that we are sort of in, 
facilitating in the institute, the goal is that all the activities go lead towards leadership, right? And so the two professional tracks that we focus on are law and entrepreneurship, uh, oral advocacy, written word, and on the, the entrepreneurship side, developing a business plan, understanding the market. Um, these are all skills that can be obtained that all really, in our minds, cultivate leaders um, and certainly have helped me in my leadership in my life. So that's just a little bit about All Square, what we do, who we are. And, uh, you know, just, just for the sake of, especially for the housing piece of this conversation, it's interesting because housing is not, is not something that we take on, although housing is my background. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about some of the housing success stories that have come from All Square, but um, it's, it is, I spent five years working as an attorney for the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, and, you know, that in conjunction with a few of the other things is, is really what fueled All Square. Um, seeing uh, d exclusionary housing policies all across the country, um, whether it's public or private policies that were disallowing anyone with a criminal record from applying. Uh, you know, the government sort of took on a mixed income housing strategy where they partnered with, with private housing developers all across the country. And, Though from a profit perspective, in some ways a, a building perspective, that makes sense. Um, the sort of, in my mind, the incentive of the government is people, not profit. Um, and the problem was that the housing providers, private housing providers, were setting the policies. So um, even though, you know, in my mind, public housing is reserved for the people, um, particularly those who are re-entering after incarceration, uh, it was... In my, for the last 30 years, uh, people who have any sort of criminal record, even an arrest um, that never resulted in a conviction, are being still today denied housing in both public and private uh, sphere. So that, in addition to seeing really sophisticated housing discrimination play out in lending algorithms, um, in just very sort of covertly, uh, the case that really set me over the top here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, was a gentleman who lost his housing um, because he was attempting to move, frankly, he was a black gentleman, um, attempting to move into a whiter neighborhood uh, by virtue purely of the amenities. And even though it was the same housing provider that was overseeing both of these housing units, he was they ran his record because he was applying to live in, frankly, a nicer neighborhood. And they had to run his record when he got his first unit in a majority uh, non-white neighborhood. And not only did he lose his housing, um, but he was evicted because a record came up that was 41 years old. Uh, he was in his 60s. Uh, him and There's affidavits from the housing provider saying he's a model tenant. Him and his wife were nothing but, uh, you know, sort of an attribute to the housing facilities. But they had a policy, and that, that was that. So really for, for me, that in addition to, you know, I went to law school down in New Orleans and was just, uh, for lack of better words, blessed to, to study with Bruce Riley, who is an, a national advocate, formerly incarcerated gentleman. Um, he was at Tulane Law when I was at uh, Loyola, and he has fundamentally transformed um, and challenged a lot of my biases as to what it can look like post-incarceration. He's spearheading sort of voting restoration across the country. Um, and him, in addition to, I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of this book, Solitary, um, Albert Wood Fox and Herman Wallace are two of the Angola Three. I was very fortunate to both know and love both of these men. Uh, I learned actually legally a lot from Herman Wallace. He was a legal mentor of mine as well, and really witnessed a lot of the advocates down in New Orleans take on the issue of solitary confinement, um, and was just exposed to the grave, grave, racial disparities and racial setbacks of the, of the criminal justice system by knowing these really beautiful people who have changed my life. So with that, um, and I will try to keep this piece short, but I really wanted to talk, Bruce, a little bit about a few of the passages in your book and a, a few of the themes just ties so perfectly into what we're doing and, and, and are attempting to do really for sure. Um, so I wanted to point out a few of those, uh, and one of the things, you mentioned it at the end of your lecture, the sort of profound paradox, and if it's okay, I'll quote you here. The people we ask to make the most profound changes in their lives often have the least capacity to do so, and, you know, for us at All Square, I think we're responding to that paradox, and I think, what, you know, one, one thing that we would say is, in so many ways, people are being asked to, as you said, make leaps and bounds to completely transform their lives 
yet we as a society and our practices and policies are fundamentally not allowing them to do that. We are excluding them from housing, we are excluding them from access to credit, we are excluding them from, the, from a right to vote, we are excluding them from employment, so we're essentially having this double standard of get your shit together and move on, um, but we're not going to let you really in application do that. And I do think a lot of this is unconscious. I don't think it's sort of a collective decision to just um, keep everybody out. But I also understand that that uh, racism is real and, and is happening in very sophisticated, sophisticated ways. And there are a lot of unintended consequences as well to, to patterns and practices that we all have become accustomed to. So for us, you know, I think one of the goals of All Square is to, is to frankly develop a brand and a business model that responds to that. Um, and the, the notion that once you have paid your debts to society, you are All Square. And Girl Cheese also happens to be generally square, so it was a fun uh, double entendre. But, um, you know, for us, you know, Bruce, you talked a lot about the criminal stigma. And again, if I can quote you, because it was just so powerful and potent, um, Criminal stigma is a special kind of vulnerability that reflexively invites fear, distrust, and moral revulsion. That is something that, that I know I have seen um, in the ways that we all, and at times myself, have responded to those who have been uh, through the, the um, penal system. And, you know, I think in, in so many ways, we're hoping to, to really focus in on, as you had said, Bruce, that people who have been through the system are being are not being viewed as full members of our community and our human community. And that is fundamentally, um, you know, from a liberation standpoint and from just a morality standpoint, just fundamentally not okay. And so one of the one of the ways tying on that that, you know, I think well, what can what can all square do? What can we do? And I, I really appreciated your talking about painting a rich picture um, of people who have been through the system. And, you know, I think that um, that has been critically important to us, right, to let our fellows self-identify what makes, what, what makes them, them tick, what are their dreams. Um, we had a really incredible photographer come, his name is Andy Richter, do pro bono uh, portraits uh, to really, on top of essays, and just who are you, what do you love, what do you do, to really start to challenge some of these biases as to what does it even look like to have been on the inside. Uh, and then one thing I want to mention on that piece is, you know, beyond just painting a rich portrait of those who have been incarcerated, I think as a white woman who has never been to prison, it's also been really important for me um, to talk about and paint a real picture and a real portrait of those of us who haven't been to prison. And, you know, it's been really healthy for me to talk about my own criminality and uh, a lot of the things I've done in my life that I didn't get caught, um, or if I did get caught, I was able to, to have the privilege to walk and work my way out of that. So one of the things that we do at All Square, and this, whether we have one All Square or 50 All Square over the course of the next 30 years, this book will go with me and will go in every All Square that exists. It's called We Are All Criminals. Um, this is by a different Emily. She is much savvier and created a much more. She's an incredible human that I love dearly. Um, but this really talks about you know, almost all of us have some sort of criminal history, um, even though we don't have a record. And some of us are allowed to move beyond that, and some of us aren't. And uh, it's important for me, uh, as a leader of this organization, that is the appropriate space for me to advocate in and to, to talk about and sort of start challenging some of the conversations that uh, currently exist. So is, am I, is that cut? Cool. Thank you guys so much. How y'all doing? Good? Yeah. I got a lot to say. <laughs> so when you raise up that sign, I'm just not going to look at you. <laughs> no, um, amazing book. Man, shout out to you. Um, I like how you humanized the people. Um, not only Peter, um, the woman who's, you know, had the back issues and everybody else. I felt like I knew a little bit about them and I'm deeply into stories, so great way of using the statistical support, but lifting up the people. Um, so shout out to you for an amazing book. Um, for me, I'm super grateful, super honored,
fortunate, blessed, whatever words you want to use to describe it, to be able to be of sound mind and body. Um, you talked about the trauma that many kids go through. Um, I went through the flames. I mean, you talk about the war on drugs in Chicago. Uncle left for prison at 12, got out when he was 18. My mother trying to hold him down. My mom, a teen mom. My father been a heroin addict since 16. He's 60 this year, still a heroin addict. You really got to be like a superhero to make it out of that shit. I'm just keeping it real, man. That stuff is not designed for you to make it out and be okay. It's designed to break you as a kid. Some of y'all know my friend, this girl, my friend killed her father when I was 10 years old. And that made no sense to my mind. I'm like, what? Then we all have asthma. We all like got these fears of the unknown. I'm just like, man, what is this? A lot of us grew up having a, a knot in our stomach. And it's like, I couldn't know, I couldn't tell what that knot was when I got older and was going through the system and constantly being told, you got a bad brain, we gotta fix your mind. I'm like, the hell you are, you're not about to touch my brain. I don't need no anger management. I don't need... You keep all of that stuff from this brain. I'm not allowing that and that got me in a lot of trouble. So the breaking is, you go from being a person, and like I said, I'm no angel. I got caught up selling drugs early, 14, you know, I was in it, in a life gang banging, got caught with an eighth of a kilo when I was 15. Um, got into tons of fights, carried guns in high school, smoked marijuana, but I could always get my, I could always get my grades done. I played basketball, so I had a balance. For a lot of my friends with mental health diagnoses or my friends who had chemical dependency problems, I didn't have those. I just didn't have an opportunity. I never struggled with addiction. I've never been diagnosed with anything, but I know I got to have PTSD, right? I'm always looking forward to, I'm like, where is it? Like, I know, I know I got it. You mentioned my hugs. It's like, I know what it's like to not get hugs or any kind of affection for years. So for me, I like, when you go from being a person to a number, I was 204956. You never gonna forget that number. People who've been incarcerated, you don't forget that number because you go from being a person to being a slave. Shackled wrist to waist to ankles. And I'm like, oh, you just can talk to me like you. Oh, really? If I talk back or don't comply on any level, I'm going to solitary confinement. Oh, you're still not gonna break me. So I went through a lot during my incarceration, never accepting any visits. I had a surprise visit one time, just wanted to get through my prison sentence. I was 21. I got out when I was 24. You know, I got caught with a pistol. I got shot up pretty badly. I got a rod and screws in my leg. But I didn't allow the system to break me. I'm like, you're not going to break me. I don't care. You can try. You can talk to me like I'm trash. You can choke me. Police can harass me. Come to my house all the time. I'm not going to let you break me. And I had to keep showing that. I had to make myself believe that. When you're in solitary confinement, like that book, which is another amazing book that Emily lifted up, when you're in solitary confinement, you rock bottom. You can't talk to nobody. you just in that cold cell. 23 hours. You got to have an ego when you're in solitary confinement. I had to remind myself who I was. I was fine. Man, I almost forgot who I was. I'm like, man, I used to play basketball, man. Like, you, was, you know, you did this. I never failed a class in high school. How was there no opportunities for this black boy from Chicago? I was always a leader, whether it was in a game or captain of the basketball team. And when I got in the system, I just got entangled. So I'm 40 years old, and at least 17 years out of my 40 years on this earth has been entangled in the criminal justice system. I've never had a passport. So when people talk about where they've been and what they've done, I could just envision it. But now I can have a passport. But finally, so I'm out of here. I'm going to I'm going to places. But, um, but for me,
me, it was like I did my prison time and I never could make sense of it. That's what sparked my quest to understand the criminal justice system. Because I was serving time with white kids who had sexually abused, who had assaulted people, and they had less time than me. You talked about that dynamic of somebody being labeled a nonviolent offender. I had that status. Everything was possession. And I see somebody who's harmed or violated a woman, and they have less time. None of the stuff made sense. If I'm going to honor the system, i got to be able to understand it. It never made sense, and I always had that knot in my stomach. So while I was incarcerated, I said, man, something's not right in here. I was a Muslim in prison. A lot of people knew me. I was a Muslim in high school. I didn't eat pork, didn't, you know, engage on that level, didn't really indulge in drinking or any of that. And I'm like, I ended up in prison. So everybody looking like, you? Now, they know I was bad in school from, from kindergarten. I was bad. But I was smart. But as I got older, they stopped saying I was smart. And I'm like, how? Like, kicked out of school, went to, you know, like, at the end of my seventh grade year, all of this trauma led up to me being in the cell. Well, I'm like, dang. Now they just got me as a gang leader. The Twin Towers fell. All of these things going against me. And I'm like, oh, this system not made to help me. This ain't rehabilitation. You trying to break me. You trying to break me. And when I realized that, I started looking at solitary confinement different. But people were going crazy, like touching their feces. And I'm like, oh, man, I can't be like that. So I'm like trying to figure out stuff. I'm counting to myself. I'm trying to remember some things I did in high school really well. I think I'm just trying to keep myself functioning. And they wanted to just like make it like I was just some ruthless gang member. And I'm like, man, I've always had a level of compassion. I've always had a heart. You just trying to make me, you trying to wipe me out. When you come home from prison, I'll see you, Michelle. I said, <laughs> when you come <laughs> when you come home from prison, you face with the toughest elements. You talk about housing. I couldn't get a place to stay anywhere. You know where I ended up back living? On the worst block you could possibly find. I lived 1841 East Magnolia after serving my time. I was paying $75 application fee over here, $30 for application fee, just for you to tell me no. And I'm like, I'm broke. When I was in prison, I got 12 and a half cents an hour. You think I got money to be paying you $50, $75 just for you to tell me no? I lived in the hood, and that was on the hookup. The chef from my job said, screw the background, I'll let you live here. I'm like, thank you. Till I came over there and visited, I'm like, oh, man, drug dealers, gang members, sex workers, police. Oh, ended up in the same place I've tried to escape my whole life. But I was still focused, and I was filmed by Hazelden during that time, and I'm glad they caught footage of me at 24, because I'm like, if I have any contact with the police, any, and you know they stopping me, I got shot, and stuff. you know, I got caught with a gun. I'm back home from, they gonna stop me. That's a violation of my probation, or my supervised release, so when they stopping me, I'm like, oh man, come on, man, like, I'm headed to work. Just don't do this, like, for real. Don't, don't stall me, don't do this. But I had to always deal with it. People get shot in my neighborhood. I got to use restorative justice. Like, hey, don't kill them. For real. Like, I got to. When I was able to survive through that and make it to college, I realized that's what I needed. I didn't need incarceration. I needed an education. And once that door opened, the community lifted me up and gave me more opportunities. I mean, I'm here because people helped me get here. I'm no form of exceptionalism at all. People saw some value in me. And said, we're going to help you get to the next level. And when I made it to college, that's when I realized I wasn't a criminal. The system was criminal. I'm like, you know I'm poor. You know I'm poor. You know I ain't nothing. Like, come on, man. You got to be a superhero to make it out of that stuff, man. For real. And I give back to everybody. It's like, if you're working on, it don't matter what you're working on. 
I try to help everybody and give to everybody. So I'm hoping I can continue to climb and continue to do the things that I'm doing and continue to have, you know, an impact on this incarceration system. But I know me being one that made it through puts me at risk. They don't want to have somebody who made it out of that stuff. I'm a threat. I'm a threat to the system. Make Nipsey Hussle rest in peace. Let me bring Nipsey Hussle into this space, man. Somebody formerly incarcerated trying to help formerly incarcerated and give them a chance to end up getting killed in his own neighborhood. I still go to the hood. Whether I'm in Chicago, when I'm in Iowa, wherever I'm at, I still go to the hood. Yeah, I got degrees and I'm grateful and I teach and I train and I do all these amazing things. I never lost sight of where I was from. Ever. I never lost sight of that. When I go home to see my mama in Chicago, it's like, we still in it. I got friends coming home next year. So I'm never really totally out of the system because the people I love still entangled in it. So I'm going to keep striving to end mass incarceration. Thank you for having me here. I'll stay within my time. I love y'all. I love y'all. What an act to follow. Wow. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I think I can keep my comments relatively brief. Uh, I so enjoyed uh, reading Bruce's book, and uh, the entire time I was reading it, I just thought, you know, I was almost creeped out. I felt like he was maybe like following me around when I was seeing patients in the jail. I mean, it it, it is it was so translatable to what I see here in Minnesota, and so I don't think you know that there was anything particularly unique about this being in Massachusetts, this could be anywhere in the United States. Um, and so I, I just want to um, highlight, I think, a few of the health things, um, since that's my field, and, um, and and maybe put a little bit of some of the, the health-related issues in Bruce book, Bruce's book into context. The first thing that um, was mentioned was that um, most of these folks qualified for Medicaid. It's a health insurance program for low-income individuals. Um, and that's actually a, a very new idea. So prior to 2014, before states could expand Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act, people leaving jail and prison did not have insurance. So it has been four years, four and a half years, that people leaving jails or prisons could even have, I mean, really even qualify for health insurance. So this whole concept of health and connecting people to care upon release is like a really new thing in the United States. Um, and, and we don't really know how to do it. Um, some of our work here in Hennepin County suggests that of that population that, that gained health insurance, a third have had criminal justice involvement, at least. And so when you hear these things in the news about um, health care reform and Medicaid, I, you should also think, you know, that about the criminal justice system. I mean, this is a huge overlap. Um, and I think one of the things that is also clear is that that insurance alone um, doesn't necessarily mean care. So get, just getting that um, insurance card absolutely does not guarantee that you're going to get the care. And so I think that is a, a, a large gap in our healthcare system that we really need to figure out. Um, the um, other thing I would say is that these these complex systems. So I thought that the healthcare system was complicated, and then I started doing work in the criminal justice system. Um, and um, uh, they don't they butt heads. So when someone enters a jail or prison, uh, their health insurance is terminated. Often, it's the case typically in Minnesota. Uh, and then you have to re-enroll. And I don't know how many people have tried to enroll in a public health insurance program. It's not a walk in the park. Uh, and so these systems that are meant to, 
you know, the healthcare system in particular, which is meant to help people, uh, is just like butting heads with these other complex public systems. Um, and that, that comes through in the book a little bit. And the other thing is that um, I thought uh, one thing that the book did really well was sort of paint a just, you know, heartbreaking and accurate picture of the health reality of folks who are involved in the criminal justice system. So you, so you often hear about mental health and substance use disorders, and but it's it's everything. It's chronic conditions. It's asthma. It's high blood pressure. It's hepatitis C. It's mental health and it's substance use. Um, and and that is that is certainly what I see um, at the jail. It, I mean, they are the sickest patients that that I've seen um, since I graduated medical school, and um, it. It, it often feels like I am practicing in a different country because of the severity of disease and just the breadth of disease that, that patients have. Um, and uh, the early age at which they start. And so, sure, I've seen patients with, with multiple chronic conditions, but often they're kind of later in life if I'm seeing them in primary care. But when I see folks in jail, it's like, they're in their mid twenties and they already have all these chronic conditions. And so we know that sort of this accumulation of disease is, is partly um, why folks um, have such high mortality rates when they leave um, prison or jail. Um, and so I think for the, the um, health folks in the audience, uh, it, it really, um, I think paints a picture of, how um, important the criminal justice system can be in um, the broader public health system. And so um, it can have um, serious negative public health consequences. Um, it's also an opportunity to, to improve public health uh, across the country. Uh, if, if done correctly. And so um, where this maybe is most obvious is in this intertwine, the intertwining epidemics of the opioid epidemic and, and mass incarceration, where we found that the majority of people who have an opioid use disorder are touching the criminal justice system uh, and often forced to withdraw and then um, sort of released without treatment. And so um, some of the work that we've been doing in Hennepin County is to try to break that cycle. The final thing that I'd say that I, that I am, um, I think, really struggling with um, from Bruce's book as, as a health professional is he comments on that sort of these health profiles vary substantially um, by race. So that um, the folks that were white um, generally had higher or more severe levels of substance use disorders, mental illness, chronic disease. Um, and that seemed to be a driver of their um, criminal justice involvement, recidivism. Whereas issues of poverty and, and economic <coughs> insecurity seem to be larger drivers um, for African Americans. And so, as a health professional, you know, I want to believe that if we do a better job of improving health, um, that that can both improve the lives for people who have been impacted by the criminal justice system um, and also reduce recidivism. But, but I think this difference in health profiles paints a slightly different picture, that that outreach might not have much of an impact on um, the, dis the vast disparities we see in the criminal justice system. And so, yes, um, you know, I think eating a bit of humble pie and saying that um, health is important uh, in addressing um, the lives of people involved in the criminal justice system, but equally important are addressing the underlying factors of structural racism and um, other factors that lead to this vast inequity. So um, thanks for letting me be a part of this and we'll look forward to questions.
So thank you, everyone. We're going to move into a Q&A now for our last 30 minutes. Uh, we'll have all of the, the speakers up here, so you're welcome to direct questions uh, to folks other than Bruce, if you'd like. Um, the way the questions will work is we'll bounce back and forth between the two microphones. So if folks who have questions could uh, come and queue up at the microphones, that would be terrific. Thank you so much. Um, the problems of our imprisonment and reentry would continue to exist even if our incarceration rates weren't as high as they are. But one, I want to ask about the incarceration rates, and in particular, I wonder how much are drug policy related. And uh, and then there's a couple other big policies in this country that I'd love to hear about, but maybe for another time, and that's drug policy and of course racism. So uh, if we, this is working, right? Uh, if uh, if we go back to uh, say 1980 and look at the growth of uh, imprisonment uh, from 1980 to say uh, 2010, uh, about a third of the growth uh, in state imprisonment, which is you know the 90 percent of the prison population. Uh, is uh, attributable to the increased uh, prison admissions uh, uh, related to drug arrests and drug arrests increased uh, uh, tremendously. So about a third of the increase is related to uh, drugs. Uh, but about half the people uh, in uh, state prison uh, have been convicted of uh, violent offences and um, I, I think the, the consensus is now, so I think it's correct, is that to really make a dent in prison populations, uh, we have to really reform uh, sentences uh, for violence. And I, I think our, our fundamental public policy response uh, to uh, social, the social problem of violence so, uh, you know, the drug war was an important factor in the growth, but uh, to really take a big bite out of the prison population now, uh, we really have to wrestle with the problem of, of violence and, and sentences for violent offences. So, um, in, your, in your presentation, you mentioned that school drug war is being a social determinant of health for issuing justice system. I'm wondering if your research covered any of co-founding factors leading to school dropout rates. And my second question is for, I didn't get your name, sorry, the physician. Um, if you're working with the criminal justice and Hennepin County's health department are combined together, do you see any future collaborations at a federal level between possibly the Department of Justice and the CDC or the National Institute of Health? Thank you. Um, I would invite everyone to I'm guessing uh, others might have something to say about uh, about schools and uh, I think uh, uh, school dropout as I was hearing about it from uh, the respondents in Boston uh, was often itself the, the culmination of a, a, a certain kind of process in which uh, you know kids were uh, getting in trouble at, uh, at school, getting suspended a lot. There was a very uh, high rate of suspension in, uh, in school. Kids were uh, getting in fights. Like virtually all of our uh, respondents reported that they were getting in fights as, uh, as kids. Uh, uh, some kids were getting expelled. Some kids were getting uh, uh, were going into juvenile detention uh, into what's called in Massachusetts DYS Department of Youth uh, Services, and uh, exp uh, expulsion uh, and then ultimately dropout. Uh, dropout was kind of the culmination of often a pretty rocky uh, sort of career in school, in schools that had seemed to have very little alternative for uh, high-energy kids oftentimes who were... Um, uh, uh, often uh, uh, going home to uh, families and, and neighbourhoods that uh, weren't always providing a lot of uh, uh, 
uh, steady sort of guardianship for them. Uh, and uh, so uh, high school dropouts are a uh, huge risk factor for state imprisonment. Uh, but high school dropout it, it itself uh, was uh, the product of a, a process in which uh, uh, kids had uh, pretty challenging adolescences and uh, early childhoods before that. And that was more yeah. Um, we just have to acknowledge, you know, we say disparities and we use those terms, you know, because we do research, but it's, it's structural racism. It's really, it's designed to, to, to be this way where we didn't have any resources where I grew up. Most of the people got carried out of my neighborhood. Like really, they either dead or they in jail. That's not just by happenstance. Race isn't a predictor of crime. So how am I ending up in a system at a higher rate? Minnesota, blacks make up over 6%, a little over 6% of the population but we make up more than 36% of the prison population in Minnesota. That's strategic. That's design. When I go to Boys Town, who do you think I see in there? People that look like us. You think that's just, it's like slavery never ended. That's what it is. Slavery never ended, man. It just got different. When I came home from prison, I thought debt was paid. But start over. I just had shinier shackles. I was visible. I wasn't free. So that's that's the thing we need to look at. Yes, yeah, the school to prison pipeline. Definitely the kids who end up in special education are not gonna get the same resources as avid students or you know students that get PSEO. You call you you're on the track to prison at that point. So we just gotta be honest about what's happening. The, the criminal justice system was des, was designed to protect wealth and whiteness. When you look at it from that lens, all of this other stuff tends to make sense. But you know I talk like this, Julius. Hit me up, <laughs> Julius. Hit me up, man. So just a bit about uh, collaborations between uh, uh, health and justice institutions. Um, you know, the, um, the National Institutes of Health, I think, are, are starting to come around to this idea. Uh, they funded some of Bruce's work, and they, they do uh, fund a fair amount of work uh, with the criminal justice system, and NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, has decided that uh, sort of addressing health disparities in the, in the criminal justice system is central to uh, doing something about the opioid, opioid epidemic and our, and our um, funding a new opioid and criminal justice um, research network. So I, I think people are... I think it is heading that way, um, but but I think given the scope of the problem, it's relatively slow. Thank you. So let's take one more question from this side, because this queue formed earlier, and then we'll switch over. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if the research showed any correlation to the uh, incarceration increase with the rise of for-profit private prisons. <laughs> the, uh, it's not in the book. The, um, I mean, uh, my take on this is that, you know, if we look at the adult state prison system, uh, about 90% of the adult beds are um, uh, uh, state beds. And so the, uh, the private, uh, private prison vendors uh, haven't made uh, significant inroads into the state prison system. Just about the entire juvenile justice system is a juvenile uh, 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 you know, institutional uh, detention, juvenile detention. That's just about all privatized now, and uh, uh, a lot of community corrections is, is privatized. I think you know, the big drivers of the changes in policy uh, that made the system much more punitive, that uh, uh, that drove up prison populations, uh, were not uh, coming from private vendors mostly. I, I think it was a very virulent racialized politics um, uh, that was very de uh, very dehumanising uh, for communities of colour uh, that created a lot of uh, racial fear. Uh, 
uh, around uh, uh, the problem of crime. And so it, that's how I see the politics uh, that drive this. Now, it's definitely the case that in particular localities, as we try and scale down the system, um, economic interests mobilise around particular prisons and so on to try and prevent uh, the closure of facilities and, and, and so on. And certainly, uh, correctional officers' unions uh, and, are another economic interest uh, uh, that has uh, taken a hard line in specific jurisdictions on tough on crime policy and. And, and yeah, I think I, I think oftentimes those politics are really cynical. That's about protecting jobs. That's not uh, about um, uh, public safety or making communities uh, safe. So I think the story is somewhat complicated. But uh, I think the big drivers of punitive uh, crime policy have really been uh, a racialized politics around uh, uh, around crime. I just wanted to add my two cents on that. So uh, having learned from the great state of Louisiana, uh, I can say that uh, from my experience, absolutely they're correlated. Uh, in Louisiana, the majority of the, of the private prisons, for-profit prisons, are owned by sheriffs and retired sheriffs. And it is, they literally uh, did a lot of research on this uh, and experienced it anecdotally. They, they exist based on human capital, making sure that every single one of those private prisons are 100% full, um, operating at no vacancy. And to look at you know Louisiana also, that correlated perfectly with the sentencing structure there. The people spending literally lifetime sentences for, for three, three different convictions that were weed, you know, cannabis related, people spending a lifetime in prison. So I would, I would answer to that 100% correlated. Brought up that um, I was very curious about and would um, hopefully uh, like a little clarification on, or at least a, a more um, explained version of. I personally haven't read your book, I just found out about this today, so I do plan on reading it. Thank you. Um, but specifically, the, the um, as you spoke previously, Tyler, about uh, in the book that contributing factors of um, whites in that study were to be um, a sense of physical health, mental health, um, and drug usage um, in comparison to uh, what was listed as um, uh, poverty and low income in the reverse of African Americans um, or black and brown communities. Um, and I would just, one for Jason specifically, also for Bruce, is there a way that you could um, particularly frame or phrase how those same triggering factors are in the black and brown POC community, but the area of poverty and those things specifically as of health, mental health, um, and drug addiction within poverty have a different spin than they do in a more affluent community, that those same problems exist on the same levels, but they just have a different view and it, they're more of an effect and part of poverty than just those factors themselves. Um, and also there was a conversation about um, the correlation or the difference between violent offenders and drug offenders in the penal code. Um, and I just was wondering, I don't think there's, or if you could uh, discuss a little bit about the separation of those, because often, especially in inner cities like Chicago or on the north side of Minneapolis, violence and drugs go hand in hand. So you cannot protect the product of a drug without the ability to have the firepower or the manpower to do so. So for that structure in itself to be viable in a market, you have to protect it. Man, that was a lot, Curtis. I don't even know. I don't even know what to say, man. Um, there's definitely, like, you know, Emily talked about it earlier when she came up here. Some people get taken home. Some people get the, I, I don't know what that's like to be taken home. Even when I go to facilities, whether I'm in California or, you know, it don't matter where I am, Hawaii, most of the people in there look like me and you. Like, so for me, I don't care if I'm in South Dakota, I, I, it doesn't matter. 
the game is you got to keep some people at the bottom. That's the game. And in white homes where there's drug use, there's usually violence, but they have protection. Our stuff gets, you know, it's a criminal justice response. So for, there's a difference between consequence and punishment. My daughters, I give them consequences. They act like it's a punishment, but I give them consequences. When you got a drug addiction and you're white, somehow you're still humanized. When you're black or brown with a drug addiction, you're vilified, you're dangerous, you're a threat. So it's a narrative piece that, I mean, if you constantly see black men paraded across the TV for doing wrong, psychologically, you say, oh, they bad. Let me stay away from black people. I, I see them on the news all the time. I see it in the paper. I see it. When you got the money, it all, it all let me just say that it all boils down to money. It all comes down to that. No matter, we can look at this, we can look at the health system. I'm going to die. I mean, on average, my 60s, I got, we got the shortest life expectancy. We got the shortest. My wife is going to live at least 10 years longer than me. And that's very real to me. So, like, both of my parents have diabetes. My mom and my father. We were made to be that strange fruit hanging from trees, to be harmed. That was systemic. You got to look at it from that lens. We can't keep saying, oh, man, white folks were able to go to Hazel and get the services. Oh, man, you know, they were, it's structural. They let in who they want to let in. When I came home from prison, I thought my debt was paid. It wasn't. They always want to keep you entangled in the system. That's the game. So for us, we got to be smart enough to read these books and look at the material and be able to say, okay, how can we make this equitable? Where just as many black and brown people, and that's not even equity. I'm just saying, let's let the same amount of people go to Hazelden who are black and brown as we do for whites. And that's not even equity. That's just equality. Equity would be letting more black and brown people go there and then you allow whites, but we're not there. We like to theorize and talk about it, but it's hard to stand in it. I stand on my values. That's why I'm always in conflict with systems and people and <laughs> things like that, because I'm going to stand on my values. A lot of us will sell out for a paycheck instead of doing what we need to do and shake that system and say, no, stop doing this to people just because you can. It's time for it to stop. I want to say something quickly. I want to try out an idea on you guys that we're uh, 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 talking about in uh, another one of the projects I have going on. There's a, a where we have this uh, project called the Square One Project, and it's really about narrative change and policy reform. It's uh, about bringing together researchers and uh, community representatives and uh, advocates and uh, policy makers and practitioners. And, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're talking a lot in that Square One group uh, exactly about the history uh, that you're talking about, Jason, and um, and so one idea that's uh, that's coming out of this group is uh, that in order to make real change, in order to make real foundational sort of change, uh, there has to be a reckoning of some kind. There has to be uh, a confrontation with history, uh, a, a real. Uh, settling of accounts with the past because I think history uh, particularly America's history of racial injustice and, and just the level of collective violence that has been perpetrated over the centuries, that gets whitewashed uh, so much and uh, uh, so we, and we talk a lot about policy reform what has to change so uh, the, uh, the square one conversation to say you know we need some sort of reckoning. We need some sort of uh, settling accounts uh, with the past, some sort of process of truth-telling, right, before we can move forward uh, with uh, uh, policy reform that's going to really make a difference. Anyway, I, I want to put that idea on the table, particularly 
uh, in the context of your comments, Jason, to your university. Let me say this time real quick. Do it. Thank you for saying that. A lot of times we just act like it's personal accountability when we talk about this. It's like, and I'm glad you didn't do that in your book. You didn't, you, you humanize folks to help people understand. It's not just me pulling myself up from bootstraps. You don't even have bootstraps when you come out of prison. Yeah. So it's like, at least acknowledge what I'm saying. Because usually when I talk like this, people are like, oh, he's just radical. He just... You know, I don't know, you know, they feel like that. And I'm like, you can't enslave people from the time you brought them from the shores of Africa and keep chaining them up and then just act like we're supposed to just rise to the occasion. That's not even realistic, man. I mean, I'm great. that's why I say I'm grateful for being here and I'm honored that people saw my value and humanized me and gave me opportunities. Otherwise, I probably would have been dead before 25. I, I don't need a full acknowledgement, but let's just at least keep that on the table when we're talking about incarceration. Keep that history on the table and look at it through a slave lens until we change the Constitution. Because that 13th Amendment says we still have slaves. That's not like we just shine away from that history. Because, I mean, if it says slavery is abolished unless or due to the commission of a crime, that means we still have it. So you can kill me in the streets and act like, oh, I thought it was my taser. Or you can, like, kill Sandra Bland in jail and, oh, she just, you can do that all day under that 13th Amendment. There's some other ones, Tennessee versus Garner. We can look at a lot of case law. But at the end of the day, I just need people to be saying it. I always feel like I'm the one that has to say it and be looked at as this, you know, radical guy. It's people who meet me in person and be like, man, you know, you a lot different than I thought. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and it's because the image has always been, man, this guy's way radical. You know, like he, you know, he, he's this and he's that. I'm just being honest and I'm just speaking truth to power. That's all. I just wanted to add one quick follow up on that. Just since you brought up something that, um, again, as a white woman in this space, trying to navigate and understand how to be an ally, given everything that's going on. You know, reparations are front and center on our, our website. We believe in reparations, um, really under the notion that sorry isn't enough. And sometimes sorry isn't even being said. But I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, we're living in a world where uh, affirmative action is being challenged. And you know, for us, I think it's it's one of the incentives of creating this is how do we ensure that 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 a population that's been historically excluded and marginalized is the beneficiary of a lucrative model of a lucrative brand. And I think for me, it's also been at this point some of the fellow paychecks are higher than mine. And I'm I think it's also what frankly white folks getting comfortable with saying with being comfortable with reparations and knowing that that might mean there's times when, when, when it's just appropriate for us to be honest about that. And, and uh, like you said, Jason, it's equity versus equality. They're very different things. So I just appreciate you saying that because it's, it's a critical part of the conversation. Uh, I don't have anything nearly as eloquent to say. Uh, I, and I, I, I just completely agree. I think from the, the, you know, thinking about the health system, um, I think our health system is generally designed for, you know, middle class educated white folks, I guess. Um, and so it's not probably the system that many people want to access, feel comfortable accessing, um, or, or that just have very high levels of stigma. And so I think really thinking about um, investing our healthcare dollars in ways that design a system that that work that works for people designed by people who have been impacted by criminal justice involvement um, kind of from the healthcare lens it, it is a place to start and to say um, it's not working and how do we invest in a way that acknowledges this history not uh, and, and designs a system that works better so we're almost out of time, unfortunately, but I think that was a really nice place to start to conclude. But I know folks have been waiting, so I thought we take one question from each side, uh, and then Bruce can have the, the final thought that may or may not answer those questions, but you'll at least get them out in this space. 
So I just wanted to, one thing when the guy asked about privatization of prisons, we need to acknowledge that all prisons are for profit. Every single one of them, and even in this space, where the U University of Minnesota profits off of slave labor in this state, we need to acknowledge that if we're going to be real in this space, because that's, that's a real thing. And every one of the prisons are, are profiting off of our, our bodies, right? Um, and one of the things that I did hear you talk a lot about is um, mothers that are being imprisoned. And we know that with the statistics of 832 percent since 1980 of women being incarcerated in Minnesota, the highest disparities fall within Native women. We are 25 percent of the women's population, but we only make up less than one percent of the population of the overall population in Minnesota. Um, and we get left out of the conversation quite a bit. Uh, one of the things that we are doing that we're working on here is a primary caregiver bill to be able to end incarceration for young mothers and pregnant women and any other primary caregiver bill to end the, the trauma of incarceration. In and of itself, incarceration is traumatic, it's dehumanizing, and it's, there's no way to get well in the cell at all, uh, no matter what kind of programming you have. And it takes away the the re-entry trauma that we all feel for the rest of our life. So I'd like you to kind of talk a little bit if you have anything to say on women's incarceration, on parenting, you know, as they're incarcerated. Thank you very much, and we'll end on this question. Um, so I think if we, you know, where I landed with this research, and um, I also appreciate the observation about indigenous incarceration as well, I think, uh, you know, coming from Australia where that is uh, uh, just kind of a, a moral atrocity, uh, Indigenous incarceration, uh, uh, I appreciate that perspective. Uh, you know, where I landed with this research, I think, uh, I think the, in general, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are people at certain points in their lives and uh, at certain points in their uh, trajectories uh, in which uh, they may pose a really serious and immediate risk uh, to themselves and others. And so I think in my general sort of philosophy, uh, uh, I'm, I'm uh, not got to the point of abolition. Uh, and the exception to that uh, is in the case of women. Uh, in the women... Uh, the women that I interviewed uh, had the most serious histories of victimization, uh, uh, the most sustained histories of victimization. So it continued well into uh, adulthood. They had the most serious health problems. Uh, you know, we had a very small sample of women in, uh, in the study. Uh, but I could see no criminal justice purpose for their incarceration. And uh, uh, and I think you know I think the case for abolition is is very very strong there, and uh, and I think uh, that women's pathways into prison are very different uh, from men. It's it's very distinctive, and uh, uh, and I think you know if we're thinking about foundational reforms, if we're thinking about sort of going back to square one and rethinking. Uh, the basics of the, the system. Uh, uh, I think women's incarceration is uh, would be one really important place to start.